Hey everyone, welcome back to another installation of videos for Biology 242, Human Anatomy and Physiology 2. And I have gained back some of my recording capabilities, so I'm excited to report that this video will hopefully resemble uh, the previous ones a little bit more closely. All right, so uh, with the last video we ended the cardiovascular system on terms of heart function. And now we're going to move on to the cardiovascular system on terms of vessels. So the heart concerns the pump of the body that moves blood around, and the vessels are, of course, the tubes. But they're not passive, so they're not just a series of tubes that blood is circulating around in, although they are to some extent that. They are also dynamic, so they are subject to change and to homeostatic regulation, just like any other system. So to assume that they are static and unchanging is a fallacy. Let's examine. So with regard to category of vessels, um, here we have a nice little chart that shows you veins on the left, arteries on the right, and then they go in decreasing size order from large vessels that are closest to the heart, all the way down to small vessels like venules, arterioles, and the arterial and venous ends of capillaries. Um, which are the small, 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 tiny ones, and they're typically found at the turnaround point where blood goes from uh, traveling away from the heart in the arteries to traveling back toward the heart in the veins. Now, I'm using the word vessels in general here. What do I mean when I say that? Well, blood vessels are any tube that carries blood. So vessels is a general way to refer to both arteries and veins. The reason I'm stressing this is because I had a couple of students email me on the practical and say, when it says identify the vessel, am I supposed to say it's an artery or a vein? And to that I said, well, you're supposed to tell me which it is. It's your job to identify arteries versus veins. So if I'm using the word vessel in a question, that is me intentionally not disclosing whether it's an artery or a vein because it is your job to tell me. So just a quick hint about how to interpret um, questions using the word vessel. It's me avoiding giving it away. So in general, an artery is any vessel that carries blood away from the heart. And I'm going to pick a neutral color here because I don't want to use the red-blue dichotomy. So, oops, too big. And then veins are any vessel that carries blood toward the heart. So we've already discussed the pulmonary versus systemic circuits on terms of the heart itself, and I pointed out at that time that uh, pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins uh, fit the category of arteries and veins in that they have blood going away from the heart in the case of the arteries or toward the heart in the case of the veins, but they look different when illustrated. So pulmonary arteries are illustrated as being blue and pulmonary veins are illustrated as being red, and that's because, of course, uh, the pulmonary veins are carrying oxygen-rich blood back towards the heart, and the pulmonary arteries are carrying oxygen-poor blood away from the heart. So relying solely on a vessel looking red or blue to make that determination is not a good idea. That really depends on what circuit you're in. Okay, so let's move on from here. Um, in general, I'm not going to pause to read you the, the contents or the captions of all of the pictures here for the most part, because that's part of your responsibility when you're reading your textbook. Um, if you have questions about them, I'll be happy to answer them in our Zoom sessions. But, you know, me going through and explaining every single aspect of this chart here is not a good use of our time. What is a good use of our time is talking about the similarities and differences between arteries and veins on terms of vessel wall anatomy. So the way that the walls of blood vessels are built out of varying kinds of epithelium and connective tissue uh, is important, and it also determines how they look histologically, as you can see from the middle panel here, and also their physical and physiological characteristics. So. How muscular are they? How resilient are they to stretching? Uh, how elastic are they? How are they regulated? Those kinds of questions can be answered by examining vessel wall anatomy. So we're going to go from outermost to innermost, and the outermost portion of vessel walls is the tunica externa. 
So externa means, excuse me, I was crossing my legs and I kicked my trash can under my desk. Sorry if you heard that. So tunica externa means the outermost layer. So you can think of this as being the anchoring layer. So this helps separate your blood vessels from surrounding tissues and also keep them still and in place. You don't want your vessels rolling around under your skin. So these are primary, el primarily elastic and collagen fibers leaning more heavily on the side of collagen. So it should be clear to all of you by now that collagen fibers are sort of the building material for tubes and flexible things. So it's a really important building material for the connective tissues of the body. Arteries in general tend to have more elastic fibers than veins because arteries are a high pressure system. So the pressure is generated by the left ventricle as it ejects blood from the heart uh, are going to mean that the arteries, especially those close to the heart, have to deal with higher pressure and higher fluctuations in pressure as well between systole and diastole. So they need to be stretchier and springier than veins. The tunica media is the primary site of vasoaction. So vasoaction is just a word that means changes in the diameter of a blood vessel. So is it getting wider? And lowering pressure, or is it getting smaller and increasing pressure? So vasoconstriction is the word for shrinking, whereas vasodilation is the word for the diameter getting larger. And then vascular spasm, if this uh, word is looking familiar to you, that is because vascular spasm is the first step of clotting, where the two damaged ends of a blood vessel uh, sort of shrink up really, really fast and make the end that is broken very small so that blood can't spill out as easily. Finally, on the innermost, we have the tunica intima, also sometimes called the tunica interna. So intima and interna are interchangeable here. Um, so this is endothelium. So it's a thin layer of squames, which I'm going to sort of color in here. And then here as well. So squamous endothelium. And then underneath that is some loose connective tissue. So I'm going to switch colors here and color this in. So a small layer of loose connective tissue. Over here on the artery side, there are some elastic fibers in there. Um, over here on the vein side on the right, we don't have those. And that's because, again, veins don't need to be elastic. So Part of the tunica intima in arteries includes something called an internal elastic membrane, also known as internal elastic lamina. Lamina just meaning layer. There's also an external elastic lamina in certain arteries as well. So with regard to arteries in general, we have various kinds, and these vary in size, in wall thickness, and in elasticity. Um, closer to the heart are elastic arteries, and these have more elastic fibers and specific elastic layers. Um, so when blood enters these elastic arteries from the left ventricle, for example, they're going to as blood enters and the pressure rises, their walls are going to expand a little bit, but because of those elastic fibers, they elastically recoil and shrink back down in response to that expansion, um, which actually helps to propel blood along. So they're part of conducting blood away from the heart. They take a little bit of the work away from the left ventricle and continue its forces as we move further and further away from the heart. So this is what I mean when I say conduction of blood. They're also a pressure reservoir, um, meaning that they help to regulate pressure of blood in the arteries as well as cardiac output does. So muscular arteries are what they sound like. So these guys distribute arteries various places, um, and they're called muscular not because they distribute arteries specifically to the muscles, but rather because Compared to their total lumen size, the tunica media is really, really thick. And so these are going to have a large degree of variation uh, in vasoconstriction or dilation 
And these are important because let's say you constrict one set of muscular arteries but dilate another, that will help you really rapidly control where blood is going in your body. So for example, uh, in the autonomic nervous system, when you have a sympathetic nervous system response, the blood vessels to your skeletal muscles dilate to get you ready to fight or to flee. The blood vessels to your lungs also dilate. The blood vessels that are going to your skin surface and to your gastrointestinal viscera, those contract. So if they're contracting and pushing blood out and those other arteries are dilating and pushing blood towards, you can rapidly redistribute your blood away from your you know, in progress sandwich digestion, for example, and towards your fight or flight apparatus. So that's just an example. So now we're down here to arterioles, this area of the chart. And arterioles basically are the last tiny arteries before capillary beds. And because they have smooth muscle, um, these are also subject to regulation by various neurotransmitters, so they can dilate or constrict. And that's going to control to what extent a given blood capillary bed is experiencing what we call perfusion, which is delivery of blood. So again, not all organs and tissues in your body receive blood at the same rate or at the same time. That's not homeostatically feasible. So control of which capillary beds are receiving perfusion and which aren't is a big way that homeostatic regulation of blood and where it needs to be is achieved. One cool feature of arterioles is something called autoregulation. Um, and the autoregulation I'm referring to is this. So if localized oxygen level, levels in the interstitial fluid drop, they will automatically vasodilate. So I'm calling this autoregulation because auto means self. So this is just what they do in response to very, very local cues that have nothing to do with the autonomic nervous system. So self-regulation. That doesn't mean that they're not under uh, control from the autonomic nervous system. They are. So they are also under control of the autonomic nervous system, specifically sympathetic nervous system. And they're going to either vasoconstrict or vasodilate uh, due to sympathetic stimulation. And just to kind of draw your attention back to 241 topics, remember sympathetic nervous system, this is your fight or flight system, you might be wondering, well, how can sympathetic innervation constrict one arterial and dilate another? And the answer is it depends on the neurotransmitter being released. But in this case, of course, most postganglionic sympathetic fibers are uh, colon, or excuse me, not, not cholinergic, my bad. Um, I was thinking about catecholamines, haha, <laughs> are adrenergic is what I was trying to say. So subject to norepinephrine. But a small subset of them are nitroxidergic, and that's going to produce vasodilation, and another very small subset of them are indeed cholinergic. So it's not the case that all sympathetic postganglionic fibers release norepinephrine. It really depends. And it also depends on what receptors the particular blood vessel is expressing. So if you need a refresher on that, go back to the autonomic nervous system and look at the specifics about the relationship between neurotransmitter release and receptors. Uh, in the postganglionic side of things for the sympathetic nervous system. So arterioles provide the greatest degree of resistance. And I wanna take a moment here because we'll talk more about resistance in general, um, but resistance really matters. And so I wanna give this concept time to percol percolate in your minds as I talk so that you're sort of ready to think about it by the time we start talking about it in earnest. So imagine that you're trying to breathe, but your only option for breathing is that you're breathing through a little tiny straw. And if you're curious about experimenting with this, go ahead and put a standard straw in your mouth and try and breathe through only that. At first it might seem easy, but the more and more you work to breathe, it's gonna take longer to get enough oxygen and longer to expel 
and it becomes very difficult very, very fast. So the reason that it becomes difficult is resistance. You are trying to move a lot of air through a tiny diameter tube, which means you have to work harder to move that air. That is what resistance is. So the fact that arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller with distance from the heart means that arteries provide an incredible amount of what's called vascular resistance to blood flow. And this is a concept we'll come back to later because it's important, especially from a clinical perspective. Okay, capillaries. So these are tiny, tiny tubes and they're relatively simple compared with the complex, you know, sort of multi-layered structure of larger arteries. Oops. So they're pretty much consisting of uh, an endothelium of some kind, so squamous cells. And the squamous cells can either be continuous or fenestrated or sinusoids, more on that in a moment. So that's just a way to talk about the degree of openness or permeability. And these are for nutrient and waste exchange. So at capillary beds, oxygen is leaving the arterial blood and going into the cells and tissue so that it can be used. So our nutrients, and then the cells of the tissue are pumping out wastes like urea, creatinine, etc. And those wastes are getting incorporated into the blood so that the veins can carry that blood through the liver and back up to the heart to recirculate. So you can look at a tissue and estimate its metabolic activity based on how densely perfused it is, so how much capillary tissue or action it has. This is actually the basis for light versus dark meat, partially. So uh, very metabolically demanding tissues, specifically muscle tissue that demands a lot of oxygen. Um, this is dark or red meat. Tissue that does not rely very heavily on oxygen is not as vascular and therefore appears lighter, and this is light meat. So next time you're at Thanksgiving and you're thinking about whether or not you'd like to eat light or dark meat, if you're someone who eats animal protein, what you're really making the decision based on is how many or few capillary beds are present in that meat. Alrighty, so speaking of capillary types, let's look. So even the most simple blood vessels, the capillary, so no tunica media, no internal elastic lamina, it's basically just a tiny tube made of very thin flat cells. But even these have some different isoforms that serve different purposes. So the vast majority of capillaries are what are called continuous. Um, and this just means that they are relatively tight, so um, resistant to letting things in and out. So here we have a continuous capillary. And you can see that the boundary between endothelial cells is quite tight, and it's actually joined by tight junctions. And transport of larger substances across the capillary actually has to occur by a process called transcytosis. So you can see endosomes here. Um, and there's a basement membrane. So transcytosis is the following. So let's say this is the inside and this is the outside. And then maybe here we have an endothelial cell and, and I'm drawing its nucleus right here. There we go. Okay, so let's say I have something large that I want to transport outside of my capillary. Maybe it's uh, some sort of large protein for some reason. What I'm going to have to do, let me make it, oh, let's choose green, why not? So I want to move this thing out, but it's too big to cross the membrane by itself. So what I'm going to have to do is transport it via a process called transcytosis. So on the inside, the endothelial cell is going to take in my green particle via endocytosis. And then we have a transport vesicle that's going to cross that short space, so the little chunk of cytoplasm in the membrane or between the two membranes. And then on this side, we're going to have exocytosis moving the green thing out. 
And the same thing happens in reverse to get things from the outside of the capillary inside. So we call this transcytosis because it's endocytosis on one side, exocytosis on the other side, depending on the direction of travel that the thing is traveling in. And I'm using thing on purpose because it could be any number of substances being transported in this way. Okay, so fenestrated capillaries, um, let's break down this word because this is one of the unusual times when a word is not in Latin or in Greek, but rather a German borrowing. Um, so we've got all kinds of languages sort of cooperating to form uh, the scientific terminology that we use for medicine and for physiology. I know it's weird. Uh, so German for window is, oops, sorry, I'm using a new little stand thingy and it's moving around a little bit. Das Fenster is window in German. So fenestrated means windowed. Capillaries. So short and fun side note. What that also means is that if I am to defenestrate somebody, that means I am throwing them out of a window. So I am removing them from a window by pushing them out. So fenestrated capillaries are ones that resemble continuous ones in that they do have uh, endothelial cells that are joined, so they're not just open like sinusoids are, but they have holes in them. So these holes, let me get a more exciting color than black. So they have fenestrations or pores across which substances can flow. So we're going to talk about the uh, fenestrated capillaries in the glomerulus in the kidney quite extensively a little bit later, um, as well as in the intestinal villi You've already looked at the choroid plexuses. Remember, these are vascular structures that make cerebrospinal fluid and also the aqueous humor of the eye. And fenestrated capillaries are also present in endocrine glands so that endocrine glands can dump their hormone products directly into the bloodstream with greater ease. So, in most cases, it's advantageous to have continuous capillaries to really tightly control what's able to cross in and out of the blood. But in some spots, it's more advantageous to have more open capillaries that can exchange things with uh, the blood and the tissues more readily. So sinusoids are over here. Um, these are incomplete, so it's like uh, a capillary was coming together developmentally and then the endothelial cells just didn't quite meet up all the way, so there's big holes in the wall. It's not an absence of capillary, it's just unfinished seeming. But these are important as well, so you see the liver is full of them, and in the liver we see these between hepatocytes. Lots of them also in the spleen, many of them in the adenohypothesis. So let's say for distribution of tropic hormones, the adrenal glands and the bone marrow. So all over the place. So sinusoids are important as well. Um, just like fenestrated capillaries, they are less numerous than continuous, but they are there and in the places where they are, they're there for a very specific purpose. Some of which we've discussed, some of which we have yet to discuss. Okay, capillary beds. So we've got blood, let me switch to a red color here. So we've got oxygen rich blood coming in this way and then oxygen poor blood. I wanted green or blue, not yellow, there we go oxygen poor blood leaving the other way. So this is a pretty common capillary bed where there's a direct route and then there's this middle area where um, there's a sort of network of small capillaries and that helps to distribute the oxygen and nutrients being delivered throughout the tissue instead of just one route straight through. 
The groups of capillaries in a bed vary depending on the size of the tissue and its degree of vascularity, usually between 10 and 100. And there is a precapillary sphincter for each, um, which is, of course, smooth muscle. And this is going to just regulate flow through a capillary. So um, you can see precapillary sphincters here. Let me get another color. I think that will jump out a little bit more. So here, here, and here. So let's say you had um, sympathetic, just for the sake of argument, stimulation that would pinch all these shut. That would prevent blood from passing through this part of the capillary bed, and instead it would send blood through the anastomosis, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So precapillary sphincters are a way of regulating whether or not blood can flow through a capillary bed or whether it can't. Okay, so let me trash all this stuff. So what if this is a tissue that is thoroughly oxygenated and I have, let's say, second messenger cascades involving calcium, and I'm going to, um, you know, let's say phospholipase base C, et cetera, are active, and that's eventually going to sort of close up my precapillary sphincters. So these are going to shut. That would send the blood through this anastomosis instead. So they're called arterio venosis anastomoses because basically they let blood skip a capillary bed and the arterial blood goes straight from the arterial over to the venule. And it goes pretty fast so that not a lot of time is left for gas exchange. So it's a way for uh, your body to redistribute blood and allow blood to pass capillary beds where necessary. So it's all part of that principle of let's make sure that tissues that really need oxygen and nutrients are getting that stuff and, and tissues that aren't as demanding of it or aren't important to supply right now are getting less of it. And all of this is very, very finely tuned by your autonomic nervous system, uh, as well as by autoregulation due to fluctuations in oxygen level. So you get vasomotion just due to autoregulation. So remember, this is changes in the concentration of oxygen um, that are five to ten times per minute. So even by themselves, your capillary beds are very capable of regulation. Okay, so we're at about 30-ish minutes for that PowerPoint um, presentation, so to keep the video sort of bite-sized, I'm going to stop here, and when we pick up next time, we will talk about veins and then move on to topics around what happens at the capillary bed um, and, you know, exchange between the capillaries and tissue fluids, etc. so forth. So thank you for your attention and I will see you in the next video.